You know, some sometimes messages come to a preacher in different ways. Uh, you know, Joe was watching uh, Bluey the other day, and he says, I got a message from Bluey. I'm like, well, and he told it to me. I said, you got six weeks to preach that message, or I'm going to steal it. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> No, we're week number five. So when I come, and no, I'm just joking. Uh, they did come back. They they were in Pennsylvania. Uh, they were. Uh, he said I, I was surprised that he didn't send me with the weather because it was 60s at night, 70s in the daytime. And I said, well, I thought you were gonna kind of tease me a little bit. He says no. He says when you're gonna be in Puerto Rico in next week, he said I figured you were gonna tease me. So I, I said, well, fair point. Uh, me and Sister Shirley will be leaving Saturday for 10 days. We want to thank everybody for the ones that stepped up and that will be taking our place. And we just thank the people of the church that we can able to get away, that we have people that we can depend on. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I like to think so, but, <laughs> anyway, but, 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 you know, you know, when the, you, you know, that, that that's like the, the the modern thinking is is um, and it's funny that that you said that because and this is not my message. I got I'm, I'm gonna get to it quick, but that's how they sell us on everything. Um, you know about you know if, if Sandals Resort, you deserve the best, or you deserve Red Lobster, you deserve the you know whatever Ruth Crisp and all that. But you know, and 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 we really like. We deserve, we deserve, but truthfully, if God would have given us what we really deserve, you know, you know, we, I'm thankful that I don't always get what I deserve because what I deserve, uh, sometimes is not the best. And I used to preach in the prison and my favorite saying in the prison is this, this is my favorite saying, you're lucky you in here for what you got caught doing, not what you really did. <laughs> oh Yeah. Their faces drop and they all bust out laughing. And, and I, I don't get, that's the, the one saying I get more amens in prison than anything else. You only got caught doing, but if, if, if they really know what you really have done, if you were to get really what was owed to you. So y'all might look at Chad and he looks like an okay guy, but if you'd really know all the things that I've done in secret over my life that God knows, and he still forgave me anyway, that is some good stuff. Amen. I want to talk just really quick about <laughs> a teacher and a mentor for a second. Uh, the teacher that I like to talk about tonight is the Apostle Paul, and the mentor would be Timothy. And I'm, I'm probably we're not going to read anything because it's scattered throughout the book, but I want to leave you <laughs> with a couple points. So Paul knew that his time was coming, and he knew uh, Timothy was a young preacher, and we need to realize some of the elders in the gospel needs to learn that they need to import before they depart. <laughs> Can I say that again? We need to import what God has given to us before we depart this earth. <clears throat> uh, I knew somebody that had this uh, famous gumbo recipe and he wouldn't tell anybody. The whole family loved this, re this gumbo. They tried, they could get close. Um, but when he died, he gave nobody this recipe. He didn't impart it to anything. So now it died with him. And sometimes God gives us a lot of things uh, I, 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 as elders and, and middle, middle, you know, you know, workers. I don't know what you call the middle guys, but, <clears throat> you know, and we need to impart that to the next generation. And, you know, the, and the, every generation see. You know, what we tolerate as a church, what we tolerate as a church, the next generation is going to accept as a church. You know, can I say that again? What we tolerate, why? Because we're not importing the, the, the things that God has taught us, you know, and, and giving it down to the next generation. That's why as a praise church, it's so important that we teach our kids the prayer. We teach our kids the importance of baptism, the importance of being filled with the Holy Ghost, the importance of having a relationship with God, having a, you know, believing, standing on. Parents, you should be imparting faith into your children. And to your grandchildren. So here Paul was, knowing that the end of his life was near. 
Paul wrote most of the, 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 the two letters to Timothy from Rome. He was, he was at, in his house. He was under house arrest. He had already had a death sentence, but he was imparting into this young preacher. He told him uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things, but there's three things that I want to touch on tonight that he could have told him anything. He could have says, said, when you preach, you need to preach in a three-piece suit. You make sure you wear a tie. Make sure your hair is slicked back. He didn't. He could have said, when you preach, you need to stand a certain way. But he didn't. He didn't teach him how to pick up an offering. Son, this is how you pick up an offering. First, you got to preach four weeks on giving to tug at their heartstrings. Then we got pledges. This is how the modern church does it. You know what I'm saying? Come on. They're going to preach it for four weeks, and they're going to pledge to build this new building. I, I promised God. I said, God, if I got to try to manipulate people, then we're going to stay on this little bitty corner for the next 20, 30 years because I'm going to, I'm believing God's going to build it. I don't have to try to beg, steal, or borrow. So, so he didn't teach him how to pick up an offering. <clears throat> he taught him. He wanted, but, but he, he imparted three a lot more, but three main points that I want to touch on, because I think it, we, it, we would do good if we would get these three points in our life, <laughs> three points. First, Paul told Timothy that you should have the dedication of a soldier. Anybody here has been in the military? <laughs> Keith? My dad can tell you that when you're a soldier, you have to be dedicated. You cannot do a halfway job when you're at watch. If you fall asleep, you're probably going to... What's going to happen? What's Article 15? Disciplinary action. action. (laughs) Probably means you're getting broke up. (laughs) so you, you got, you're going to have a, a, a consequences. But what he said, as a Christian, as a minister, we're all ministers, whether you like it or not. As he said that you should have the dedication of a soldier. I like that he said, he said that a good soldier, when he goes into battle, he's not worried about what's going back, back home. He's not worried if his dog's getting fed. He's not worried to the day-to-day life. Why? Because what's in front of him is so much more important. It's on the back of, it's in back of him because he realized your life is at stake when you go into this warfare. And as a child of God, that you should have the dedication of a soldier. The definition of dedication means selfless devotion. Oh, isn't that a soldier? Where there's so many times you hear that somebody took fire for their friends. A good friend of ours, and he tells a story, and I like when he tells it in youth camping. And Brother Lupe went to Vietnam. And he tells a story of this young White cat went home and he was, a, he, and he was, he was a Christian and he went home and I cannot remember his name to save his life. And brother Lupe was a gunner on a chopper in Nam. And he said, man, he loved when his, when it was his time. He said, man, I'd get there. And he said, I thought I, I was invincible, man. I was on that big gun, <clears throat> you know, and, 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 I, and I would unload the whole nine yards. And, and here we were, and, and he said, but it was his turn. And the young guy, and for the sake of not knowing his name, his name will be Sam for this story, true story, but that's not his real name. And he come back, and he went visit his mom. And when he got back on his, his leave of like 30 days, and he said, De La Rosa, I'm going to take your, your shift today. And Brother Lupe said, no, man, I'm going. He says, he sa- he sa- he says, he says, I'm going to shoot me some Viet Congs. And he said, no. He said, today I feel like I need to, to take your place. So he said, after a while, Brother Lupe said, I said, fine. He said, I'll just take the day off. Long story short, on that mission, the chopper was shot down and everyone in the chopper died. 
And Brother Lupe said, what, what, what Sam didn't know is that he took my place. Because God had a purpose for me. And God says, I got to keep you because I got something for you. But, be, but when you're in warfare, you have to be selfish devotion. It's not about, it's all about winning. So it's all about the end result. It's all about the end. It doesn't matter about me. I know I'm hot, but I got to keep pressing. I know I'm taking fire, but we got to keep pressing. I know the enemy comes against me, but I got to keep pressing. Doesn't matter what I feel. Most of the time in a battlefield, you're hungry, you're cold or you're hot, you're wet, you're probably sticky. But when there's fire coming at you when you take in the heat <coughs> you're focused and Paul said Timothy as, as a young minister as a Christian in the faith you have to have the dedication of a soldier there's no turning around <coughs> you know I like history and history is one of my favorite <laughs> things to to, to to like study and if I if I have downtime uh, you probably not gonna catch me you will not catch me playing any kind of video game that's not my thing uh, you probably won't catch me watching very often some kind of series Netflix unless it's some kind of sci-fi here and there a Star War or Star Trek here or there because that's just not my thing but you will find me watching a lot of documentaries and and what always fascinates me is the story of Benedict Arnold. Because Benedict Arnold was one of George Washington's greatest generals. He was, uh, he, he was very, very smart. He, 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 he had won victories. Uh, uh, he, had, he had saved forts. He saved the war many times. But somewhere in Congress, somebody did not like Benedict Arnold and they can't figure out where but so they would always demote him he would never get what he was deserved he had spent his whole fortune fighting and they would never pay him back so instead they, they made him the governor or the it's called governor but like the, the 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 military leader in Philadelphia and he had met this young girl and they think she was a traitor and he married her and then all of a sudden he got assigned to, to, to be the leader of West Point. That's not what he wanted to be. He wanted to be in the action. See, because only the, the loser stayed behind. You know what I'm saying? He wanted to be in the action. So at that point, it's when he decided to betray and turn Fort Point over to the British. And that's when that would have almost sealed the fate of the war. Long story short, he had a meeting. The dispatch went back and the the guy bringing the dispatch was caught and they found the dispatch knowing that he was a traitor. And now we goes down Benedict Arnold forever for tra being a traitor. All the things that he did, the good stuff, the, the, the fact that the, that, that, that the United States was still in the war to that day, all that he did, there's no, there's no turning back. There's no turning back. And you know what catches me, you know, you know, in that story? And to put it in spiritual, he decided to turn away. And because he turned away, he joined the side. He was on the winning side, but he joined the side that lost. So Paul said, hey, don't turn around. Endure it like a good soldier. The dedication of a good soldier. Number two, he says that we must have, Timothy, you must have the discipline of an athlete. Run the good race. The definition of discipline is training expected to produce a specific character or pattern of behavior, especially training that produces a moral or a mental improvement. He says you want to have a discipline. I begin to think because football started this weekend and all these guys have been training. They have discipline. They're on a diet. They have a workout routine. The, they, their body is trained to be able to go three hours, play after play after play. They train to be able to breathe. Why? There's discipline. The definition of the word disciple is discipline. He said an athlete won't get very far. 
if you're not disciplined. Either in your body. Now, sometimes there, there is one-offs here or there like John Daly. <laughs> Never mind. If you've seen John Daly, you know what I'm talking about. He, he's a golfer, but but he's he's not shaped like an athlete at all. <clears throat> you know, but some kind of way he made it. You know, or, or you know, or there's got to be a discipline. Think about it, at ch ch people of God. Are we discipline ourselves in the Word? Or well, the Bible says this: Are we tossed about with every wind of doctrine? Think about it. what it says, a wind of doctrine. He talks about doctrine is a teaching or a belief, a core belief that's held. So he called it a wind. It blows here, today, here. Today, today you hear, and today you hear. And you, I, I, I hate arguing with somebody that keeps changing their position because you hold nothing. W whatever the wind blows, that's where you're at. Yeah, they change their position like people change clothes. But he said, be it disciplined. Stand. An athlete, most of the time, they don't do any other like major things. If you're a football player, they focus on football. They eat, sleep, football. If you're a baseball player, you eat and sleep. Baseball, especially training camp, most of the year you got a little bit of time off. And off season, they got workout regiments. Whatever you do, if you are a professional and you play at a high level, that don't come easy. Everybody wants to see them at the level, but they don't see the journey that it takes. They see your glory, but they don't see your story. That started out at five years old, practicing hitting a ball every day, catching a ball every day. And now that you're 30 years old and you've won the Super Bowl, they don't see those 25 years of work. Another definition of discipline, control Obtain by enforcing compliance or an order. <clears throat> Control obtain by enforcing compliance or an order. You do the same thing. Number three, the definition of that is controlled behavior resulting from disciplinary, disciplinary training and self-control. The discipline of an athlete. As long as it's going to be this quiet, I'm going to stay on this point a little longer. <laughs> Do we have the discipline of an athlete? You know, certain athletes, I would not attempt to do a couple like sports. You're never going to see me snow skiing. Because I realize that my legs are not strong enough to keep. I tried to water ski once, and I did not realize that you got to hold your legs together. And it, it went, Whoo! this ain't happening, bro. You better stop. I, I give up. Why? Because I knew I didn't have the strength. But it takes discipline and, and it takes endurance and, and, and with discipline comes endurance. And the, the, is there any wonder why the church is so shaky, you know, and because we need to have endurance. I like that controlled behavior, re controlled behavior. Can I say that again? Controlled behavior. <laughs> but sometimes the church is wild. <laughs> so some of you in here know my grandson Ezra he, he's been at school three days so far today is the only day that they didn't call the principal didn't call he's at a charter school the first day he gets out of his, his desk and he sits down and, or under the desk and the teacher said what are you doing he said this is boring and I'm about to make some bad decisions, so I put myself in timeout. <clears throat> the next day, he got upset. He left his desk 
and he ran down the hallway, they couldn't catch him, and they shut down hallways, and then the teacher tried to grab him, and he swung at her. That is not controlled behavior. But that's how the church is. Sometimes we wild. All we discipline, as you as a Christian, all you discipline in your prayer life. Or you just pray whenever you feel like it. Or you discipline in your word. Or you just read whenever you have time and, and, and in between your, in your spots. Do you carve out a time for God? Because I guarantee you, if you make time for God every day, he will beat you there. That's what he did for Adam, and he'll do that for you. Number one, the dedication of a soldier. Number two, the discipline of an athlete. <laughs> and number three, he says, have the diligence of a farmer. <laughs> the definition of diligence is marked by persevering, painstaking effort. With careful attention and effect, Careful, painstaking, not careless or negligent. Steady and earnest in an application or to a subject, the pursuit and industrious, diligent. So what he's saying is, hey, you need to have a dedication. I am dedicated to this and you ain't going to turn me back. I have sold out to God, and it doesn't matter what comes or what goes. I'm here, and I will always be here, and no matter what happens, I believe in this word, and I will not be persuaded. You have the discipline of an athlete that what you believe in, that, that you will discipline yourself, that everything in life is for that one cause that I'm not going anywhere, that I'm serving God, and everything that I do, my actions, my speech, is all towards that thing that I believe in. Everything I do in life is for that one goal. <clears throat> I told, uh, so Shirley was asked about this certain t-shirt, and I, she said, you can have it if you want. I said, I don't want it. I said, why? She said, why? I said, because this is a billboard. And if I wear a T-shirt with a saying on it, I want it to be a godly saying because that's what my this represents me. You know, the way we dress is letting the world the world know who we are. So, so when I wear a T-shirt, I want to let them know straight where I'm coming from. <clears throat> and then he said, if you have the dedication and you are disciplined to that one thing that you're trying, that you're dedicated to. He said, then you have to be diligent. A farmer gets up and he begins to till the land day after day. When the land's ready, he puts a seed in the ground and he covers it up. Day after day, he waters it, he nurtures it, he pulls the weeds. And then when the plant begins to grow, it ain't done yet. He's got to keep watering it. He's got to get the bugs off. He's got to get the birds off. He's got to get all these things off. And then when it comes, then finally, the fruit is produced. Then you got to stop the pests from eating the fruit. Then you got to begin to harvest it. It takes diligence to be a farmer. That you, that's not for the faint of heart. This ain't going to Walmart. When you go to Walmart and you pick up an avocado, you don't really. That's months and years and millions of dollars of work. And it touched this one and that one just to bring it to market. It's because there's diligent men that said, I'm not going to stop. Marked by persevering, painstaking effort. Paying close attention. Not being careless. So Paul taught us that we need to have the dedication. So let us just examine our life. Is there dedication? <clears throat> Am I dedicated to the one that's dedicated to me? 
He dedicated his life to us. I want to dedicate mine. You should want to dedicate yours. And then we need to discipline ourselves for his call. I already said it, but I'll say it one more time that an athlete's work 5% or less of their effort is seen by men. A three hour game has been followed by a 60 hour work week to have that little bit of success. Um, Melissa Hessler, Hessler, I always say their name right. If you don't know who they are, they're one of the worship teams from Bethel in, in, in California. And she always tells, if you watch any time she talks, she says, this is the 5%. On stage, people listening to you, singing, worshiping, she says, this is 5% of your life. But serve God with the other 95. You got to have the discipline. And then be diligent day in and day out, day in and day out. I'm going to be diligent because I'm, because I'm dedicated, <clears throat> I'm disciplined, and then I'm diligent. And I'll end with this, Pastor Blade, some of you know him, some of you don't. <laughs> uh, I like to call him the professor because he seems to know everything about everything uh, church-wise and not. He's the only preacher I know that was literally at Woodstock. And uh, so he's like an old hippie. And he always tells a story. I've been in his church. If you, you've heard this story before, on the front pew, there's a big dip where the, he has pews and his cushions and there's a big dip. And because I've traveled with him extensively and preached there hundreds of times at his church in Mississippi, that is his prayer spot. So four or five o'clock in the morning, he gets up, leaves his house, drives the seven, eight miles in the town to the church. <clears throat> he has an interesting drive because he gets up, he drives down Bebo Road, he turns onto New Africa Road, and he turns onto Bram and Davenport Road to the church. I haven't figured out what all those names mean, but that's the roads that he... And then for the next three hours, he spends with God. Last time I said, I talked to him, he said, Chad, the longer I spend in prayer, the, the less I find myself speaking and the more I listen. <laughs> and he, he, he said, I was there, we were there, me and Keith was there maybe four or five months ago. And he said, Chad, there has been a sweetness. He says, it has taken 50 years. But now every single morning, every second is precious. Because at the beginning when God said, if you meet me every day, I will meet you there. And God told him, he said, I won't meet you right away. But if you're diligent, if you're dedicated, if you're disciplined, and if you're diligent. I think Paul was on to something because Paul knew what it had taken in his life to get to the place where God had brought him. And if it was good enough for Paul to tell Timothy, this should be your focus, my son in the faith, I think it's good enough for each one of us to apply that to our life. Now, it's not going to be easy. You're going to fail multiple times. But be diligent. Be diligent. One of my favorite saying as we get ready to close is, a reporter asks Alexander Grand Bell, uh, uh, Thomas Edison, excuse me, not the telephone, the light bulb, how, how did you feel to, fall, to fail 250-something times making a light bulb? He said, I didn't fail 250 times. I just found 250 times, 50, 250 ways not to build a light bulb. 
but he wasn't going to stop. You know, one thing I learned about Thomas Edison, he's this great inventor. He was not a great inventor at all. You know what was he great at? He was great at taking somebody else's idea and making it better. That's all he would do. He didn't invent the telephone, but he made it better. He didn't invent the telegraph, but he perfected it. They had versions of it before, but he, that's all he was good at. Go back. Well, you know, Google it. Trust me. It's true. So I started thinking, here we all trying to invent a new wheel. Churches try to invent the wheel. We try to make something new because we got to stand out above the crowd. It's already been invented. Doesn't, his word's already there. All we need to do is just implement it and make some things better. If it didn't work, make it better. Quit trying to be the great inventor. Quit trying to make a name and start following after him. Because let me tell you, he said, if I would be lifted up, I would draw all men into you. Praise Church can't do it. The, the TV evangelist can't do it. Chad can't do it. Nobody, you can't do it. But if we just lift him up, they'll just lift him up. Because the, the truth of the matter is, as great as we all think we are, if people's not coming in the world today, they not God's not drawing them. The problem is, is we're not lifting them up. We're lifting up everything else. We're lifting up a genre of music. We're lifting up a preacher. We're lifting up a singer. We're lifting up great buildings. But he said, if I would be lifted up. <clears throat> so I'll end with this. For the fourth time. What was Paul dedicated to? What did Paul have discipline for? And what do you wanted you to be disciplined? And diligent to? Jesus. The Lord. Nothing else. Because nothing else matters except Jesus. You don't matter. I don't matter. We don't matter. All that matters is him. And can I tell you, if you did choose to give your life to him, totally over to him, that'll, that'll fulfill you because we have an emptiness that we try to fill with I but it can only be filled with him because every heart has a God-shaped hole yes. and it can't be filled by a man or woman. It can't be filled by money or riches. That's why some of the richest celebrities of our day die from overdoses, shoot their brains out. It's Jesus. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Give us that discipline, Lord. Lord, give, give us the dedication, Lord. Lord, give us the, the ability to just put you first in everything, Lord. Lord, let you be the first thought in the morning and the last thought at night. Lord, and the first word that comes out my mind, let it be your name. And as I go down to sleep, Lord, let your name forever be on my lips. Lord, just like David went from pray, praising you once, twice, three times, but in the end he says, I praise you now all the day long. Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, thank you for your servant Paul telling your servant Timothy to be able to relay it to us, your servants. We give you all the glory and all the honor. And the church says... Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap.